Good evening and uh, welcome to Pulse Exchange. Um, it's a huge, huge pleasure to be able to welcome our guest this evening, uh, who is he's one of the world's leading economists and uh, within urban economics, probably the leading thinker in the field. Um, Professor Glesser is an incredibly fertile thinker on a whole range of different issues. Uh, he's written about obesity, he's written about uh, racial division in America, uh, and he also spans an incredibly sort of range of interests. So for example, on the one hand, I've recently been uh, reading his rather dryly titled book, uh, Cities, Agglomeration, and Spatial Equilibrium, as a, as a dream. <laughs> and on the other hand, he's in uh, this week's uh, Time Out magazine, the, no, in the sex edition, no less. Uh, so so he he's succeeded where others have failed in making urban geography sexy issue. Um, we, we at Post Exchange have a particular uh, reason to be, to be grateful to him, not just because many of the things that we are interested in, be it housing, be it planning, be it infrastructure, uh, he, he is a leading thinker on. Um, some of you also may remember that a few years ago we published a, a paper called Cities Unlimited, in which we, we made the observation that it wasn't always necessarily possible to regenerate every single city, particularly where they would lost their original economic rationale. Uh, and there was a, uh, this was called by a volley of abuse and abuse of the anti northern and one of the two people in the world who defended that publication <laughs> is, is sitting next to me now. In fact, we have the author also somewhere in the audience. I spotted uh, Tim Lloyd is. Two authors. It's two authors uh, here, here this evening. So thank you for that. You're not only a hero to us, you're also clearly uh, of great interest to our new government, the coalition, of doing all kinds of things in uh, planning reform and housing. Uh, and uh, having listened to your very interesting exchange earlier on with uh, Lord Heseltine at Downing Street, your, your thinking is clearly influencing them a lot, so this is a very timely moment for you to be here. And, and lastly, but not least, it's a very timely moment for you to be here because, of course, you have a brilliant new book out, uh, available at a discount, a very reasonable price at the back of the room, if you're, if you're interested, and signed too. So please do do go and give it a look. This is this is an absolutely wonderful time to be able to welcome you here. I don't want to sound like a stalker, but I, I wanted to have you come to Big Policy Change for the last two and a half years. So this is a this is a great moment. So thank you so much, and uh, over to you. Thank you, thank you very very much for that kind introduction. And I, I can I can say that I've certainly wanted to speak policy change policy exchange for several years. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity as, as well. I I, I have. Uh, been a big fan of, of your work for many, uh, for much, uh, much time, um, and I'm very, very grateful to all of you who uh, took time out of your own busy schedules to, to hear me, uh, to hear me talk. Um, it's it's wonderful to be in London, certainly one of the world's greatest cities, and to be able to enjoy and experience this city's uh, this city's renaissance. Um, the um, I want to start uh, this talk though very far away from London in the, in the streets of Cairo. Uh, because I think it actually makes a, a central point. Um, the, the uprising that ousted Hafiz Mubarak has been called the Facebook Revolution because, of course, Facebook did play a role in it and Google executives were important. But it also shows something else that I think is central to my talk here today, which is that new technologies are making cities more, not less important. Because, in fact, Mubarak wouldn't have been ousted if people had just tried to block him from their Facebook pages. They, they needed to actually take to the city streets. They needed to actually come together in cities. And in Cairo, uh, we don't know where events will lead us. Things can go awry, as they often have in, in urban revolutions. But at least we have the promise that city air will once again make people free, as it has done for, for centuries. Um, and indeed, this represents, in some sense, the paradox at the heart of this book, that we live in an age in which telecommunication costs have, have dropped away to nothingness, which is effortless to electronically connect across oceans and continents in which we could all dial it in from whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia. And yet, we don't. And yet, over and over again, in places throughout the world, we've chosen proximity. We've chosen to be close to one another. We've chosen to actually put up with the inconveniences that so often come with city to city life, despite the fact that we could just electronically connect. And you see this, of course, in the economic vitality of the developed world cities like London and like New York. If the rest of America became as economically productive on a per capita level as New York City, America's GDP would increase by 43%. London's GDP is, of course, also per capita significantly higher than the rest of, the rest of England. And, and, of course, even the high housing prices that are indeed a significant challenge for these cities are also a very tangible sign of people's willingness to pay in cities like, pay for cities like London, not just as places to work, but as places to play and live as well. And that's a sign of urban, urban success as well. The power of 
cities to actually create change is even more obvious in the developing world. What you're looking at is the relationship between urbanization and per capita GDP across, across the world. On average, those countries that are more than 50% urbanized have incomes that are more than five, four times higher than those countries that are less than 50% urbanized. They also have infant mortality levels that are one third as high. This doesn't mean that we should be artificially pushing people into cities, but it does suggest that urbanization is an intrinsic part of the development process. That in fact, the coming together in cities is really central, and the cities like Mumbai, like Shanghai, like Bangalore, are places that are the conduits, the connectors between continents and civilizations. Uh, what you're looking at here is, is two pictures, uh, two pictures from Bangalore. On the, on the, from your perspective, the, the left-hand side is the Mind Tree Camp. Mind Tree is a, a you know beautiful example of, of Indian of Indian success. It's a sleep camp. It's a place that's filled with visitors from from throughout the world, and it's a place where Indians connect with each other and learn learn from each other. The success of Bangalore reminds us of something that's really important, which is that from a Western perspective, Bangalore or Gargan, uh, another great Indian, great growing Indian metropolis, may be the place that you call when your software is gone awry. When you know, your Boingo doesn't work at the airport. But from an Indian perspective, it's nothing like that, right? It's a hyper-dense city where smart people come to cluster around each other, to come there to learn from each other, to come there to be part of, of this great you know, uh, enterprise. And I tell stories in the book about a young software engineer who comes to India, comes to Bangalore from a, a much more disadvantaged area and acquires, by working first at Yahoo, acquires the, the skills to actually go out on his own and create a bunch of reasonably well-functioning web pages. Not a, not a billionaire today, not a Narayana Murthy uh, type character, but, but a person who is clearly the most successful person in his family ever by a very long shot, and, and Bangalore helps to make that, make that possible. I think that story and the concentration of technology helps give us a clue as to why cities are more important despite the death and distance of globalization. What those forces have done is that they've increased the returns to innovation. They've increased the returns to being smart. And we see this in scores of studies showing the rise in returns to human capital throughout the world, that being educated, being skilled is more valuable than ever. And why shouldn't it be? What globalization has done is it's increased the possibility of innovative in ways that you yield vast profits from across the world because you could make it on the other side of the world, because you could sell it on the other side of the world. I was struck as I was going around India researching for the book that at the right in the middle of the slums of India, there were ubiquitous signs for James Cameron's movie uh, Avatar, right? That, so the, you know, and which reflects a deeper reality that the growth of Hollywood's revenues over the past decade have come from foreign sales, not from sales in, in the US. Globalization increases the returns to coming up with new ideas in, in movies, as it does to coming up with new ideas in finance and new ideas in technology. Now, what the reason why this matters for cities is that our greatest asset as a species is our ability to learn from people around us, is our ability to soak up information from those people that are near us. We come out of the womb with this just remarkable ability to, to learn from people who, who connect with us. Cities play to that. Cities make us happen. And cities make that happen. They collect people who learn from each other. They learn from. They enable people to learn from the, uh, from successes, from failures. And, and new technologies aren't in any sense making that less important. They're making that more important. In part because they're making ideas more complicated. And the more complicated the idea, the more that you need the richest form of intellectual transmission. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part of teaching is not having a script. It's not actually just writing the words and expounding them from on high. It's figuring out whether your audience gets it. It's figuring out whether or not this, this notion that you have is actually getting across. Now, we've developed over millions of years the ability as a species to communicate with each other at close distances, to transfer enormous amounts of information about comprehension or confusion through our facial expressions, through our body language, through everything that's, that's going on in us. And cities help to make that, that happen. Cities also create those happenstance occurrences that are responsible for so many of our greatest breakthroughs. They enable those creative chains of collaborate, those collaborative chains of creativity from Athenian philosophy to Ford's Model T's to Facebook that are responsible for humankind's greatest hits. I'll return to this story later, but I mean I, I love the examples of this that show up in the arts. So, you know, we think about the glories of Renaissance painting in Florence. It's, it's, a, it's a chain of connected people who knew each other because of Florence's density. Brunelleschi figures out the, the mechanics of, low, of linear perspective and passes it to his close friend Donatello, who puts it in low relief sculpture on the walls of Orson Michele, who passes it along to uh, Masaccio, who puts it in the Brancacci Chapel, who passes it along to his uh, student, that less than monastic monk, Fra Filippo Lippi, who passes it along to Botticelli, and so forth. Each new idea builds on itself, each new idea creates the possibility for something new. And that's what cities enable, and that's what they continue to enable today, and that's in some sense what makes them so, uh, so special, and that's what. Um, 
have just these images. This is, of course, the famous School of Athens, and this is, this is a picture of a, of a Dutch boat going to Nagasaki. And the School of Athens reminds us that this ability of cities to connect people and make, uh, make magical things happen is in no sense new. Uh, I mean, Raphael himself, of course, is part of that chain of painters, but the School of Athens reminds us of the incredible flowering of brilliance 2,500 years in that city, as, in the same sense that New York, flushed with military success after World War II and commercial dominance, attracts many of the finest minds of the European diaspora who come to that, that city and create magic. Athens, in the same way, based on its own commercial success and military triumph, attracts many of the finest minds of the Greek diaspora, the philosophers who educated Socrates, the great urban planner uh, Hippodemus, the, the fathers of, of playwriting and, um, and history, uh, for that matter, come to Athens to be part of it. And they bring their knowledge with them and they transmit it to their students, like Socrates, who educates Plato, who educates Aristotle, and so on. A chain of, of brilliance that's responsible for, for much of the most precious things in the, in, in the West. Nagasaki is the chain through which Dutch learning, and earlier than that, uh, Portuguese Jesuit learning, makes its way into, into Japan. That city, so concentrated because of Japanese xenophobia, then produces the, you know, a concentration that then enables Japanese to come and acquire, first of all, medical knowledge, and knowledge about other forms of, of technology that makes it possible for Japan, when it's opened up after the Meiji Restoration, to so quickly catch up uh, with the European, European nations. Um, and so we're left in a world today, this is the relationship between metropolitan area size and, and per capita output in the US. It's an enormously strong, not a perfect correlation, but an enormously strong positive correlation. We're, we're left in a world in which cities are just enormously productive and enormously vital. And that's in some sense the triumph of the city that I'm, that I'm talking about in this book. Now, this success of cities looks very different from the New York of my own youth. And these are two iconic images from that age, from the 1970s. The top image is President Jimmy Carter wandering uh, through, the, uh, you know, through the deserted areas of the South Bronx in New York, uh, uh, you know, a strong image of urban decay. Below it is his predecessor, Gerald Ford, vowing to to veto any bailout for the city's uh, fiscal distress. And at that point in time, it looked like history itself, not just President Ford, was telling New York to drop dead. It looked like it was a city whose time had come and gone, never to return. In some sense, that was entirely understandable, because if you go back and you think about all of the older, colder cities, they'd all formed on the basis originally of, of transportation networks, and then manufacturing had formed around those transportation networks. And as the core economics of those cities had changed, manufacturing left. New York in the 1950s had the largest industrial cluster in the US, larger than automobiles in Detroit, was the garment industry in New York, and it was hammered just as, just as badly. London shed 540,000 manufacturing jobs between 1961 and 1975. Enormously hard, hard uh, forces that hit these, the, these cities. And it, it made sense that they would, that they would suffer uh, because of the, their, their history, and because their original economic raison d'etre had fallen away. So if you think about the, the you know, older cities of America, they are the nodes that lined a great transportation network that made the wealth of the American hinterland accessible in the 19th century. So if you go back to 1816, it cost as much to move goods 32 miles over land as it did to move them across the Atlantic. It was just that difficult to move goods over space. And so Americans perched on the eastern seaboard clinging to the Atlantic Ocean as a lifeline. Now, over the 19th century, there was an investment in a, in a transportation network, first canals, investments like the Illinois and Michigan Canal, investments like the Erie Canal, that opened up the West in, in the first place. Cities formed as nodes on those canals, Buffalo, the western terminus of the Erie Canal, Chicago, the linchpin on a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans, made possible by both Erie and then later Illinois and, and Michigan. And rails only came to supplement those later as things, as things went forward. Now, industry then formed around those transportation nodes. So, <coughs> New York's three dominant, in oh, this is a boring thing to look at. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, oh, what the heck, you get the stockyards. Uh, New York's three dominant industries during the 19th century were, uh, were, were sugar refining, uh, the garment industry, and printing and publishing. Sugar refining, which came first and was actually the largest industry by value added at the start of the 19th century, was very natural. New York was part of a triangle trade, which in which New York shipped um, basic, basic food products like grain down south to the cash crop, crop colonies of the south. The cash crop colonies then shipped sugar out and then they were manufactured goods coming from, coming from Europe during the early years. Now because there was all this trade with the Caribbean, there was sugar coming north, which was, of course was one of the great 
hash crops. You can't refine sugar in the Caribbean during the early 19th century because sugar crystals coalesced during the long, hot uh, sea voyage. So it was natural to reap the economies of scale of doing it in a large central location. And New York was that large central location. And family fortunes like that of Franklin Delano Roosevelt started in the sugar trade. Old Isaac Roosevelt was not, as you may have erroneously heard on Mad Men, a farmer. Uh, he was, in fact, a sugar refiner, a, a nice urban, urban job. Uh, that starts his family both on, on his political path because he opposed um, English mercantilist policies during the 18th century and thereby got himself involved in the American Revolution, but also because it, it um, started the Roosevelt family on, its, on that branch in terms of its, its wealth. Um, garment production, very natural in New York. One of the great innovations in New York transportation during the 19th century was the establishment of packet lines regularly scheduled boats that would cross the Atlantic. Before that, of course, boats would stick in New York, whether until they actually filled their hulls. Packet lines were regularly scheduled trips, which traveled. It, they weren't, it wasn't a complete innovation. In fact, the, the British mail carriers had, had previously gone on regular, regularly scheduled lines before that. But in terms of commercial stuff, it was, it was a, an innovation. Who, who did the innovation? Jeremiah Thompson, one of the many immigrants who actually made New York, a Quaker Yorkshireman who was part of a great wool, wool-making family from, from York. Um, Who's, who you know, was shipping so much uh, you know, cotton through, uh, through, through New York that it made sense for him to get into the transportation business a, as well. Um, the, uh, and the garment industry then comes out because there's so much cloth going around in the city and because there's so much demand from people like the sailors and selling to the slaves for ready-made clothes. This is where Brooks Brothers gets, gets it started, the low end of the market in terms of creating re regularly uh, custom-made uh, pre pre-made clothes. And then, of course, the last example of this is printing and publishing, and that's one of my favorite stories of this, that the big money in 19th century American publishing was from printing pirated English novels. Right? We, of course, had no copyright protection in English novels throughout the 19th century. And uh, none of, no, no Asian country has anything on our pirates in the... Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a line that Thackeray met uh, the, the, one of the Harper brothers that he... Uh, he introduced him, I think, to his to his daughter, to his sister, to somebody as, as so this so this is the great pirate uh, when, when describing Harper. But the Harper brothers came to came to dominance because of the port, because in a world in which there are no property rights over books, the whole money was in publishing first. You had to be the first one to actually publish and being able to flood the market. Why were the Harper brothers able to be able to publish first? Because they would get the books first. Because the boats with the books would show up in New York Harbor long before they showed up in. in Philadelphia, and if you think about the, you know, the their rise of dominance, because they got the latest, you know, Sir Walter Scott novel, because they got Peveril the Peak, literally, uh, long before the Carrie and Lee, and they were able to publish in 24 hours and saturate the market before their Philadelphia competitors uh, competitors did. Now Chicago as well, great transportation hub. All of America's 20 largest cities in 1900 were on major waterways. Uh, Chicago as well, and then of course rail yards formed, uh, connected those areas as well, and, and great industries like the stockyards formed around the rail yards. What you're seeing here, that, that name is Armour, who's one of the two great uh, leaders of the, uh, along with Swift, of the American packing industry in Chicago during this time period, and responsible for the innovation of putting the ice on top rather than the bottom, which made it possible to ship frozen beef uh, across, uh, across the US by, by rail. Um, now, one of the remarkable things about cities like Chicago is that even when they form for utterly mundane reasons, they still, by collecting genius, by collecting people who learn from one another, create amazing innovations that enrich our world. This is the home insurance building, described by many as the world's first skyscraper. A skyscraper, by this definition, is not defined by its height, but by the combination of having some height and a load-bearing steel skeleton. Now, I, was, I visited yesterday St. Pancras Station, which is a, a beautifully renovated building at this point in time. But St. Pancras is important because it's, it's tall, it's huge. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a skyscraper. It has traditional load-bearing walls. And as a result, of course, as, as you all know, the walls are fortress-like. It's like being at, a, you know, at, at one of Richard the Lionheart's castles in terms of how, how strong they are. That's wildly expensive, as opposed to having a, an, a steel or iron, cast iron skeleton where the masonry hangs like a sheet on top of the underlying metal that, that actually bears the, bears the walls. Now, the person, the architect who's given credit for this is William Baron Jenny, but it's very clear that he did not invent this in a, in a vacuum and is best not seen as a solitary genius creating this. He didn't even get the whole thing right. Only two of these walls are, are steel, uh, steel bearing skeletons. The, the back walls, the party walls, are traditional masonry walls. 
And indeed, there were a whole cluster of people like Daniel Burnham, like Louis Sullivan, like Paul Bird, like Roche, all of whom came together in Chicago, all of whom worked together. Both Burnham and, and Sullivan were, uh, were, were apprentices in, in Jenny Shang, and who borrowed each other's ideas, came up with new things, and created this innovation collectively. Um, and, and did something fairly remarkable in a city where the main business, of course, was killing cows. Uh, the, uh, um, Similar stories of, coll of collective genius occur in, in Detroit, right? So what you're looking at the image over here is Detroit dry dock, one of the great industries that came up very naturally around the inland waterways that flowed through Detroit. Of course, you'd have a dry dock in a great, great inland port. And Detroit imported human capital, like Frank Kirby, uh, who was one of the leaders of Detroit dry dock, who had you know Eastern train skills and actually created a whole lot of innovative inland uh, inland engine works. The, the Detroit Dry Dock then was, an, was a school, was an educator for people like this guy, who you may not recognize, it's the young Henry Ford, who got to start an engine business working in Detroit Dry Dock, which is where he, he actually got, got some experience doing this. Um, Ford was only one part of the set of automotive geniuses in Detroit in the start of the, the 20th century. The Fisher brothers, the Dodge brothers, David Dunbar, Buick, Billy Durant, nearby Flint, all of whom were competing with each other, borrowing each other's ideas, supplying each other with, with parts, supplying each other with, uh, with financing. And collectively, you know, it feels like Silicon Valley did in the 1960s, you know, smart, small firms learning from each other. Collectively, they created this, you know, remarkable, remarkable thing, the mass-produced cheap, cheap automobile. Um, you know, you can tell a similar set of, set of stories that was unfortunately excised out of the book, but I, I had a series Another set of stories about the creation of roller spinning, which is probably well known to many people here. This is Lewis Paul's original patent for, for roller spinning, I think from 1754. And this is, there's a chain through which Paul, Wyatt, Highs, K, gets that idea ultimately to the person who then operationalizes it with his water frame, Richard Arkwright, a chain of, of brilliance around, uh, around Birmingham and, and elsewhere in the industrial heartland of England, where this new innovation is created. And the Industrial Revolution is very much a child of the city. Uh, obviously also in Glasgow, where the young uh, Watt gets educated in how to fiddle with a Newcomen engine in, in, the, in the city and actually acquire the, the human capital needed to actually do something miraculous. Of course, then Birmingham connects him with John Iron Mad Wilkinson, who, who's the, the person who's actually able to make the cylinders that are good enough to actually make the separate condenser engine, steam engine, Boltner Watt engine uh, operate. Um, the, the tragedy of industrialization uh, it was that it actually was a great idea for, for generating incredible productivity in the short run, but it generated a model that was fundamentally less beneficial for cities in the long run. And in some sense, if you go back to the, you know, to the, the Birmingham of Bolton or the New York Valley Center Hamilton in the 1790s, you see that cities were successful then because of small firms, smart people, and, and connections to the outside world. Those are still, by the way, the recipes for urban success statistically today. If you go, if you think then about what the Industrial Revolution brought, it brought things that looked a little bit like, like this, at least at first, and then it brought much bigger things. Right? This is Ford's River Rouge plant, a vast, uh, <coughs> vertically integrated operation, walled off from the outside world, providing thousands and thousands of jobs for less well-educated Americans. On one level, that was great. On one level, you know, we could use a little more employment for less educated Americans right, right now, less than four in ten of whom are currently connected to the labor force. But on the other level, on the other hand, it produced something that was fundamentally antithetical to urban interactions, right? Once you've got this factory, you no longer are part of the fabric of Detroit the way that Ford was when he was a young entrepreneur. You create something that you know can be easily moved into the suburbs, as River Rouge was. Heck, you can move it to a right-to-work anti-union state in the South if you're looking for lower labor, lower labor costs. Heck, you can you can move the thing to Mexico. You can move it across the Pacific. It doesn't need to be part of a city. And when the transportation cost advantages of places like Detroit and New York vanished, industry left. What you're looking at here is the cost of moving a ton a mile by rail in the U.S. over the 20th century. It's a 90% decline. So whereas at the start of the 20th century, it was incredibly valuable to have access to the rail network of the north and the waterways of the Great Lakes, by 1970, that advantage had vanished. And there was no reason to have your have production of ordinary goods in big cities anymore. And so factories left, and they pursued the, the cost advantages to be found elsewhere. And this is what Detroit Dry Dock looks like today. Right, an uh, emptied out hull of the building. You can see it was always, it was an, an, an innovative form of industrial architecture during its time, but now it's a, an empty shell. You also have empty buildings here in the UK as well. 
Um, the, um, the, the flip side of the decline in transportation costs was that Americans moved to places that they wanted to live instead of places that had a production advantage. And no variable better predicts the growth of metropolitan areas in the U.S. than January temperature. Uh, and so, you know, the combination of declining transportation costs and heat bias to technological change, things like the air conditioner and the elimination of, of cholera in the, in the South, made it possible to move into lower cost areas and more pleasant areas. I, I will differentiate a little bit later, maybe I'll just do it now, between the early areas that grew like <coughs> California that are genuinely just a lot more pleasant in terms of climate to live in between the modern areas, the four fastest growing metropolitan areas in the U.S. since the last census are Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix. And no one confuses Houston with Santa Barbara in terms of how pleasant the climate uh, it is. The growth of those places has actually more to do with un unregulated housing supply combined with a, a reasonably successful economy than it does with any real love for Houston's incredibly human uh, climate. Um, and of course, the car had another effect, which is that it, it remade American urban spaces. Cities have always reflected, urban spaces have always reflected the dominant transportation technology in the era in which they're built. Our oldest urban spaces are, of course, built around pedestrian transit with narrow streets and, and buildings that are close together. The streets often wind around, around areas. The move to wheeled transport, the omnibus, for example, which comes in, in the 1820s after um, Pascal's abortive attempt to bring it into 17th century uh, France. Uh, the omnibus, of course, enables a, a flow up and a need for more gridded, larger spaces. The, the streetcars and then rail and that enables a, a further expansion of, of cities and uh, a growth out of urban areas. But all of these older forms of transportation still required walking. They required walking when you got to the train stop. They required walking to your office, to your home. The car is different. The car is a point-to-point -point form of transit. And as such, it both enabled and required vast amounts of space to create urban, urban living around the car. Now, uh, there are good economic reasons why Americans love their cars. The average commute by car in the United States is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transit is 48 minutes. In part, public trans transit is slow because it takes a, there's a fixed time cost between 15 and 20 minutes of walking to the stop, waiting for the thing to, to come, and then, then going away from it. But of course, the government also massively subsidized it, right? We, we built huge uh, highway networks uh, throughout the US, and each new highway that cut into an urban core reduced that city's population by 18% relative to the metropolitan area. That's worked by Nathaniel Blau Snow. And so we created places like Levittown that provided through massive scale the same sort of Henry Ford or, or Richard Arkwright technology of mass production, but it's mass production of housing. It does so on and it provided affordable housing for returning servicemen in the post-war period, but in a, in a relatively, by modern standards, Spartan, although it was a heck of a lot better than the dumbbell apartments that had populated the tenements of the Lower East Side beforehand. Um, and then today you get things like the Woodlands, a great growing suburb north of Houston, where people for relatively modest fee by, by, by the standards of any one of whom us who live in, uh, live, in, live in an expensive area can afford a 4,000 square foot house with remarkable amenities and you know for less than three hundred thousand dollars I mean it's a, it's a it's a remarkable thing that mass production is actually able to 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 accomplish and it's not surprising why a million Americans chose uh, chose Houston it doesn't make it right it doesn't mean that we haven't engaged in policies that have foolishly subsidized this and have actually induced far too many Americans to choose it but it is important to recognize that people did, the people who moved to the Sundell aren't crazy. And uh, in fact, it's, um, you know, it it's, it's provides a lot of affordable housing for ordinary Americans. The result of these changes uh, led to an enormous hollowing out of America's older areas. What you're looking at here is the 10 largest American cities as of 1950. And what happened to their population over the next 50 years? I'll have updated 2010 data probably in about six months. But with the exception of New York, which very modestly grew, and Los Angeles, which grew far more than modestly, uh, all of these cities lost at least 20% of their population, and three of them lost 48% or more of their population, Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis, an enormous hollowing out of people as they both suburbanized, they moved to sprawling Sundell metropolises, and um, they left uh, uh, empty cities like that Detroit Dry Dock building behind. The economic decline of these cities, which had lost their economic raison d'etre, uh, was accompanied, of course, by social distress. And what you're looking at here is a picture of the Detroit's monumental 1967 riot, which reminds us that while cities create the connections that can lead towards you know, uprisings like uh, Boston, Boston in the 1770s, or Paris in 1789, or Cairo in, in 2011, where you know, we think actually there are possibly beneficial things that may come out of this, often urban uprisings have more cost than benefits as surely the Detroit riot 
uh, did. Um, and in addition to the social chaos that was associated with decline, governments often did exactly the wrong thing. So the American federal government was in the 1950s and afterwards ready to subsidize structures but not to invest in people. And as a result, cities like Detroit ended up engaging in urban renewal in the 50s and 60s, building new houses in places where housing was already abundant. And then later, building transportation infrastructure like this thing. This is the, the people mover monorail, which, which glides over essentially empty streets in, in Detroit, <laughs> um, providing no discernible benefit that I can possibly think about at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, this, this is the point. The hallmark of declining places is that they've got a lot of infrastructure relative to people. The last thing you really need to do is to build more transportation infrastructure in a declining city. The last thing you need to do is subsidize housing in a place where more than 90% of the homes in Detroit are currently priced at significantly below construction costs. Right? This is an area in which they've got a lot of homes, they've got a lot of vacant homes, and they don't actually need subsidies creating more infrastructure in these areas. What they needed was they needed this money to be pumped into the people. They needed to actually invest in human beings, not to invest in, in un unneeded structures. Now, the cities that came back didn't come back because they necessarily avoided this infrastructure strategy, but because they had something else. And it's, you know, the story of, of New York, which I'm going to tell here, is not dissimilar to the stories that I could tell about Boston or Minneapolis or Seattle or many other of America's older cities that were able to come back. But it, it's a story about, inevitably, unfortunately, finance, uh, which is um, unfortunate because um, recent events in finance have made finance a less popular industry than, than, it, once, than it once was. Uh, so I end up apologizing for this uh, often. But in fact, 42% of Manhattan's payroll is in finance and insurance. And there's no escaping the fact that it plays an enormously outsized role in the comeback of New York City. Now, the comeback of finance, to me, feels a lot like the kind of chain of invention that I discussed in Renaissance Florence. There's they're sort of a, a set of ideas about thinking about the trade-off between risk and return that come out of the University of Chicago in the 1950s with people like Jimmy Savage and Milton Friedman. Those ideas then get passed to the young Harry Markowitz. They then get carried by embodied by people like Fisher Black and Jack trainer to, uh, to Wall Street. Those ideas then enable the young Michael Milken to convince investors that high yield, that junk bonds, if, if you will, carry a sufficient return to offset their, their risks. Those junk bonds then enable Henry Kravis to engage in larger leverage buyouts which get value out of American corporations and push better management on many of them. That trade off between risk and return then enables securitization to take off and enables the young Lou Ranieri, who's an example that I like, because he gets it started in the Solomon Brothers mail room, which shows the continuing ability of cities to be providers of, of a, a, path, a path to prosperity for people who start with less. And then follows along the same, the same path. And the example I like best is, is this one of Michael Bloomberg who's in some sense a final link in this chain. And in one part, he's just part of this chain. He's the fellow who sells the data terminals that enable this you know, more uh, mathematically intensive form of, of investing and evaluation to occur. But he's more than that. He's, he's an example also of the ability of city, cities to create cross-industry fertilization through the spread of ideas. Now, because he's not fundamentally a financial billionaire, right? he's not fundamentally a financial entrepreneur, he's an IT billionaire. Right? He's in the same business as the guys in Silicon Valley. But he has something that they don't have. He has knowledge that he gained in New York. He, he has the knowledge that he gained running the trading floor at Solomon Brothers and then being in charge of the technology back room at Solomon Brothers before he got pushed out. And when he starts on his own as an entrepreneur, he knows what the people at Merrill Lynch want. He knows what the traders at Morgan Stanley want. And he's able to deliver the data tools that they actually value because he got that in New York. And he's able to be enormously successful because of the knowledge that the city, the city actually gave him. He's also a great example for a third thing, which is this is the famous New York City bullpen, the elimination of walls within, the, within City Hall in New York. And it's modeled on the earlier office design that Bloomberg used at Bloomberg LLP. And before that, that's ultimately modeled on, uh, on the trading floor of Solomon Brothers. Now, trading floors are a funny thing because they contain some of the most highly paid people in the world. And in normal industries, those people sit behind large offices and are protected by secretaries and large open walls. But in places like this, they live right on top of each other. They sit, they sit right next to each other. And they forego the pleasures of privacy because they value information more, because they value knowledge <coughs> more than space. And that's fundamentally what this is about, okay? And fundamentally, that's the city writ small. London has come back, New York has come back because people value knowledge more than space. And that's, that's basically what these comebacks are, are, are all about. Um, now, the importance of 
knowledge of idea transmission, of learning, of the ability of density to speed the flow of ideas, is shown out statistically in things like, like this, uh, like the incredible correlation between skills and urban growth over the last uh, 40 years, actually over the last 110 years, but the last 40 years has been stronger. So this shows the, the general correlation between the share of the population of college degrees and just rank these in quintiles and subsequent population growth. This is strong and significant across all American metropolitan areas, but it's far stronger. This is the same relationship just looking at the Northeast and Midwest and the U.S. Okay, the, the older region skills proved absolutely vital for explaining which cities were able to come back and which ones weren't. And you want, if you wonder why Boston is doing better than Buffalo or New York is doing better than Detroit or Minneapolis is doing better than St. Louis, most of these cities are doing exactly where you would expect their skill level as of 1970 or 1960 to, to be. Skills are important in part because cities are, are you know, machines for connecting people who learn from each other, and people with more skills have both more initial knowledge to transmit, and also greater skills at communicating, and probably it has more to do with just the type of people they are than with anything we actually teach them in colleges. Um, and the, the, one of the things that's fascinating about cities, and particularly skilled cities, is that the urban wage premium, the added income benefits that you get from being in a city isn't something that accrues overnight. It's not something that migrants who come to cities immediately experience. Instead, what you see is a faster rate of wage growth year by year, month by month, as people in cities see their wages going up gradually over time. And I think that's most compatible with a view that, that's really Alfred Marshall's view, that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air, in this ability of cities to actually transfer knowledge and to actually change, you know, hard-working but relatively ignorant young people and to still hard-working but much more knowledgeable middle-aged people. Um, this is, this is um, I don't know why I had this in my computer, but it is a fact that's true almost everywhere. And this is a fact for Scotland. I don't know why I particularly had Scotland in my computer, except I, I, uh, I once wrote a paper on, on Scotland for Wendy Alexander, and I guess that's why I had this thing floating around. But it, it still remains true there. And, and you know, everywhere, everywhere that I know of, and it's true in India as well. This is the, the reason why, of course, skilled cities have grown so much, because there's an enormously strong connection between the skills of a city and the wages in that city, even holding individual skills constant. So what you're looking at along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, is the share of the population of college degrees. Along the y-axis is the wage residual, which means I'm looking at individual wages holding their own skills constant correcting for the fact that people in general with more skills are paid more. And what you see is holding individual skills constant. As the share of people in your metropolitan area with a college degree increases by 10%, your wages go up by about 8%. Working, having skilled neighbors is just very valuable. This is the same figure um, for India, which is actually even a significantly stronger correlation. Um, this is the tendency of skilled industries to disproportionately urbanize, to locate in the central core of urban areas. Um, and this is the relationship between skills and unemployment across metropolitan areas during the recent recession. Mm -hmm. Skills were an enormously powerful predictor of which areas were hammered and which ones were not. And this effect is much stronger than the effect that you would predict by the fact that 15% of college graduates were during this period. Sorry, 5% of college graduates were unemployed and 15% were of high school dropouts were unemployed. This is a, a much stronger correlation, which again reflects the value of having skilled neighbors. But of course, the skills in cities are not primarily the stuff that we teach people in universities. We always hope we're teaching people some, something useful, but it's not always too obvious that we actually are, right? Uh, and indeed, the, 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 you know, the, the most important skills are, I think, ones that are actually learn on the job. And one of the types of skills that's particularly important is, is the talents of being an entrepreneur. The, the great economist, uh, the economist Ben Shinitz, uh wrote 50 years ago about why New York seemed more resilient than Pittsburgh did in the post-war period. And he argued that New York's industrial history, its focus on the garment industry, had created a, a culture of entrepreneurship because there never had been very big barriers to, to entrepreneurship in the garment industry. That in fact, it was pretty easy for a guy with a couple of sewing machines to get started actually making something. And New York's history is replete with examples of people who did just, did just that. And many people who got their start in the garment industry then moved into other, other industries. I tell the story in the book about A.E. Lefcourt, the, um, the great builder of skyscrapers in New York prior to 1929. And he got his start in the garment trade. Well, actually, he got his start shining shoes and selling newspapers. But once he moved up from that level to the garment trade, he actually, that's where he became big. And then he moved into actually building industrial buildings for the garment, garment uh, industry. And then he moved into building skyscrapers, like the famous Brill Building, which came, contained so many of New York's most famous composers in the 50s and 50s and 60s. Um, Leftward himself ended almost broke because he, like many developers, uh, developed to excess and, and was sure that 1930 was going to be a great building year. Uh, it, he wasn't actually right on that one. And, and today, um, uh, people like Sanford Weil, recently a city group before that, Shearson Lehman and so forth, his father was a garment 
right? So he presumably then moved into, into other industries, but he presumably got some of that spirit at the, at the breakfast table. Um, now, urban success, the urban ability to move things forward, is often masked by the fact that so many poor people live in cities. What you're looking at here is the favelas of Rio that, that are right above the beaches. Um, a similar picture, of course, could be told about this is the, the Durabi slum, for many years uh, supposedly the largest uh, slum in, in, in Asia. Um, but the tendency to, to denigrate cities because of either their poverty or inequality is a mistake. Poverty everywhere is terrible and inequality is a significant problem, but there's nothing particularly wrong about urban poverty. After all, cities are not making people poor, they are attracting poor people. They're attracting poor people with the ability, with the promise of economic opportunity, with the ability to partner with people who are entrepreneurs, who have capital, who have skills, who can turn you know, poor people who have little into something, into giving them a, a better life. And Durabi is, in many senses, a place of enormous promise. You walk around the place and there are you know, little entrepreneurs everywhere. In one, in one room, there are a couple of, couple of guys making braziers with a couple of sewing machines feel like you're back at 80 Leftport's day in, in, early, in old Manhattan. And then in another room, there are people who are recycling plastics, going through all sorts of plastic goods and sorting thing, things out. And, and you know, in another, another area, there are people who are making little pots with intricate little, little designs. And it feels like a place of remarkable promise. And I think that's fundamentally right, that, that there's no future in rural poverty. And people who look at the slums of Mumbai and think they're awful are idealizing the alternative for these people. It's not that their lives aren't enormously hard. They are enormously hard. None of us would like to spend a day, let alone a lifetime, in, in Durabi. But it beats rural India, just as the favelas of Rio beat the rural northeast of, of India. And there's a reason why these people chose these areas. They're not fools. They're not madmen any more than the people who chose the woodlands are, are madmen. They're choosing, they're choosing a place that actually offers them the promise of some kind of change. Now, that doesn't mean that all is well in Durabi, and it doesn't mean that's all is well, it's well in, in any of our growing megacities. Um, the, the same spirit of entrepreneurship that you see in Durabi is coupled with, you look down the street, you see a kid defecating in the road, and you see unpaved streets, and you see the unclean water of these areas. And these are, are terrible things. And they remind us that density also has its downsides, that if two people are close enough to exchange an idea face to face, they're close enough to infect each other with some form of contagious disease. And if two people are close enough to, one person is close enough to sell another person a newspaper or a book in person, they're close enough to rob each other. This, these negative externalities, as economists would put them, congestion, contagious disease, and crime, are familiar demons of cities. And the process of fighting them is an enormously hard one that has taken millennia in the West to actually achieve. This is the, the picture of uh, death rates in New York over the last um, 200 years. <coughs> Life expectancy in New York at the start of the 20th century was seven years shorter for boys born in the city than it was elsewhere in the country. Today it's actually almost two years longer. And of course London for much of its history had a life expectancy gap of five years or more relative to, to rural England. When the, you know, as much as I'm, I'm now extolling the virtues of, of urban living, uh, you know, the, the late poets weren't crazy when they thought of London as being a place of disease in 1820. In fact, it was a place of disease in, in, in 1820. That only changed with massive investments, and um, you know, cities in, in America in the early 20th century were spending as much on water as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. And I tell a story in the book about how the cities of New York, respond, the cities of the U.S., responded to the yellow fever epidemic of the 1790s. And in Philadelphia, they introduced public water works. This is what Luke Trobe's doing, and it worked reasonably well. New York followed a private, um, a private model, which, which involves subsidized private water provision. And this came out of a somewhat uh, unholy combination of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Burr would, of course, later shoot Aaron Hamilton, but not over this one. Uh, he hired Hamilton to be his lawyer uh, and to represent his interests with, with Hamilton's Federalist buddies on the New York City Council. Um, and in language that will feel familiar to anyone today, ha uh, Hamilton would argue that having public waterworks would create burdens and taxes, that's the exact quote, on the city, on the people of the city of New York. Um, you know, the Federalist Council went along with him, and uh, Aaron Burr's Democratic buddies on the New York State Legislature went along with him, and Burr got his private water company. Now, the whole key, the reason why Burr wanted this private water company is it would come with an enormous advantage. It could have come with the ability to run a bank, okay? And, and in fact, there was only one other major bank, there was only one other, one other company that had the right to do banking activities in New York, Hamilton's own Bank of New York. So they created this entity, and, but the problem, of course, was there was no money in clean water. 
uh, and the, the company did very little clean water provision because that wasn't a lucrative activity. He did, however, do a bit of banking, and the, its successor is still with us. It's called J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, and which was at one point in time the Chase Manhattan Bank, which was before that the bank of the Manhattan Water Company. Okay, and uh, this was not a you know this was not a feasible model for providing providing water, and it took New York building the massive Croton Aqueduct, a massive engineering feat, to actually provide the water that actually made the city more more livable. It also took massive interventions like street cleaning, which uh, under George Waring, which I also discuss. Cities also dealt with their disease problem through self-protecting urban innovation. And this is, of course, the famous ghost map, the cholera map that Jon Snow put together from London, where he figured out that the water pump lay at the root of a cholera epidemic through observing the patterns of, of disease within the, within the city. In a sense, this shows the ability of cities to create knowledge in a different way by providing evidence for, uh, for people like Jon Snow, and sometimes the father of epidemiology, that actually then enabled the city to solve its own problems. I, I talk a little bit about the investigation of AIDS in Paris in the 1980s, where sort of similar processes were at work, with cities actually generating information that were needed for identifying the source of an illness and eventually taking steps against it. This is crime again. You know, it's, it's, it's remarkable that sort of Rudy Giuliani manages to pitch himself now as a small government guy, uh, because in fact, Crime was, was reduced in New York only through massive government intervention, right? Massive incarceration of vast numbers of people, significant increases in the number of cops. There's a reason why people in rural Montana don't like government as much as people in New York. The people in New York needed more, right? Yeah. Cities actually require decent government to, to function. They need government to actually handle the externalities of, of urban proximity. And in some sense, the, the, you know, the, the public message of this book is not, you know, uh, we need government to do the things that government needs to do, and we need government not to do the things that government is not good at doing, right? And we need we need we don't need monorails in, in Detroit, and we don't need government to play venture capitalist in urban areas because it's not very good at that either. And but we do need, in fact, governments to worry about the serious business of actually handling the downsides of living in in uh, dense areas. Uh, of course, while the Croton Aqueduct was a clean water was a problem that was solved with an engineering approach, you can't engineer your way out of congestion, and and that's you know something I don't need to particularly cell in London as, as you're of course one of the one of the key examples of congestion pricing. This is congestion pricing in Singapore, uh, which is it, it, even significantly more effective. Uh, and the cars, as you can see, in one of the densest places on earth, traveling at high speeds through the central city through very advanced electronic technology that actually enables uh, pricing to be very specific to time and, and place. There are there are upsides to having less democracy occasionally in, in running, <laughs> running a city. Um, and of course, you can't build your way out of, out of uh, traffic jams because uh, the, the fundamental law of traffic congestion, vehicle miles traveled, this is work with Gilles Durant and Matthew Turner, increased roughly one for one with, with highways built, highways miles built. Right? So if you build it, they will drive, and you actually need to, you need to not follow the Soviet Union and follow a Soviet-style transport policy. And by that, I mean that the old Soviet groceries used to provide food at way lower market prices. And the result, of course, was that you had long lines and stockouts. Well, that's basically what America does, at least with its roads. It, it provides valuable space at significantly below market prices, and the result is long lines and stockouts, which we call traffic jams. Uh, so, um, but the upside, uh, this is another boring picture. Uh, let me show that. But the upside, of course, of defeating density demons is that cities can prosper as places of pleasure as well as prosper as well as places of productivity. And certainly, London is, you know, a place of enormous fun and excitement, because the same entrepreneurship that makes for, you know, productive financial firms also makes for exciting restaurants. And I think it's, you know, one of the most amazing things coming back here, you know, over many decades is the, the transformation in this place, place's food scene is just stunning, right? Uh, if I think back to when I used to visit here in the early 1980s, when, you know, the, the, great, the great culinary innovation was the, you know, delight was the scotch egg. And you think about, you think about where we are, uh, where we are today in terms of this being clearly one of the great eating capitals of the, of the world, um, it's just a remarkable innovation. Of course, you know, London is full of other pleasures that are made possible by this scale that enables fixed costs like the theater and like museums to be, to be born. And of course, above all, cities are fun because they're full of people. They're places where young single people be, go to be around other young, young single people. And this is, this is of course, again, a, a joy of, of, urban, of urban density. Now, the downside of all this success is that if you have a city that's more productive and more fun, People will want to live there. Demand for housing will increase. And if you don't build the housing when, when demand is rising, prices soar. This is, this is New York City over the last uh, 50, 50 odd years. And the declining line is permits, 
and the rising line is prices. Okay, so New York built a lot more units in the 1950s than it did in, in the 1990s. It has picked up somewhat under Bloomberg, who I think deserves deserves points for this, but certainly not enough to sate uh, sate the remarkable demand. And there's been a uh, there's a web of enormous restrictions on building in, in New York, and those those restrictions, which differ so much across space, help explain this pattern. So along the x-axis, you're seeing the amount of building between 2000 and 2005, and along the y-axis, you're seeing prices as of 2005. I tried to do it a little bit before before the peak of the of the bubble. But what you notice is that places that are that build a lot aren't expensive, and places that are expensive don't build a lot. Okay, that pattern pattern is only compatible with views that there are very big supply differences across space in the U.S. And these supply differences sometimes have to do with land. It's always going to be more expensive to build up than to build out. But in some cases, it's just to do with regulation. So my own home county of Middlesex County, the counties in Boston were actually named after the counties that ring, that ring London. Uh, so Middlesex County has you know, more land per capita than Harris County, Texas, which includes, Tech, which includes Houston. And yet it builds a fraction of the housing and is vastly more, uh, more expensive. And also, of course, doesn't, doesn't grow. This is where Jane Jacobs got things wrong. And um, you know, many of the ideas in this book, many of the notions in this book were ones that the great 20th century urbanist Jane Jacobs uh, wrote of. But in this, she erred. Um, she was a big fan of preservation and restrictions on building. And while there are, in many cases, a, a good case to be made for preserving our, our older, older buildings, and I'm the son of an architectural historian, and, and I certainly believe that our greatest architectural treasures are, are legacies that are no less valuable and no less worthy of protecting than uh, the Arnolfini marriage in, in the National Gallery. But uh, at the same time, there always is a trade-off. And this is what Jane Jacobs got wrong. She looked around New York, and she noticed that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive. And so, so she came to the view that the right way to keep New York affordable was to make sure nobody got to build any new buildings. That, in fact, we should just preserve the old buildings and that will keep New York cheap. Well, that's not how supply and demand works, okay? <laughs> if you keep the city low, if you keep the city old, you're not allowing supply to keep, to keep up with demand. And every time you restrict housing, you, it means that there's one extra family that isn't going to be able to move into the city and enjoy its pleasures. It means that all the rest of the people living in the city are going to face more of an affordability issue. I'm not saying that there's, a, there's always a right answer. Uh, again, I want to be clear here that there are trade-offs involved. But there's no sense in which you can you know, keep a city more affordable by preserving it in amber. And I think her own home neighborhood of Greenwich Village illustrates this. She was very much involved with the preservation movement in Greenwich Village that created a great swath of a preservation district in Greenwich Village. In fact, 15% of New York South of Nine, Manhattan South of South 96th Street, excluding Central Park, is now in a preservation district. Right, where change is basically completely forbidden. Now, Greenwich Village, when she lived there, was a place where ordinary middle-income people like her and her husband could afford to live in townhouses. Okay? No person with an ordinary income can afford to buy a townhouse in Greenwich Village today. Right? They started $5 million. And it's, like, it's like Kensington or something. The, 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 it's, uh, you know, it's, it's enormously, uh, enormously costly. And that's, that's what her opposition to change helped, helped create. Um, and this is obviously an issue that London, as it, as it builds up, needs to, needs to confront. These issues are even more severe in places like Mumbai, which I, I you know, sad to say has embraced some of the worst aspects of, of extreme floor area ratio restrictions in a city that needs height as much as any other place in the world, with the city of Mumbai has enormous promise to give, uh, to give India, and yet it's shackled by having incredibly draconian rules that make it impossible to build up. And as a result, the, the, the place builds out. And indeed, that's one of the reasons to be in favor of allowing more building in the center, is you don't, therefore, you know, you have instead of, instead of building more strong, you have more construction at the, at the urban core. Um, one of the reasons to be in favor of that is the environment. And I'd like to end with just a little story about a young Harvard College graduate who, in a beautiful spring day of 1844, went to do a little fishing in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts, actually not far from where, where I live. Um, and. Um, he, 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 he does a little fishing. The fishing is good because there hasn't been much rain lately. And then when he comes to cook the fish in a chowder, the wind flicks the flames to the nearby dry grass, and the fire starts, and the fire spreads, and it grows, and it grows. And soon an inferno has, has come about, which has burned down more than 300 <coughs> acres of prime concrete woodland. Okay. Um, this young man was castigated in his own day as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman called him a flippity gibbet, which I think was pretty terrible in 1844. <laughs> and indeed, with good reason, right? I mean, this was a person who did more damage to the environment than anyone I can think of who lived in Cambridge or Boston during the same time period. And yet, this person is now revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. This young man, has, uh, whose name is Henry David Thoreau, uh, is famous for preaching the, vir the, the, the virtues of living around nature, and yet his own life tells a different story. His own life tells us, reminds us, that we are a very destructive species. 
And that in fact, in many cases, if you love nature, the best thing to do is to stay away from it. <laughs> As indeed, Thoreau would have done the woods around Concord a great deal of benefit by staying away from them and staying back in Cambridge, where he was going to do them a lot less harm. Indeed, you know, and this is a story that David Owen tells in Green Metropolis, and Jane Jacobs also tell, tell versions of this in, in the 1970s. Indeed, you know, uh, I myself, when I started acquiring small children, you can tell I'm an economist, but I don't think economists talk that way. Uh, when I started acquiring small children five years ago, uh, uh, my wife and I moved to a place not uh, unlike this and started doing uh, almost as much damage to the environment as Thoreau did. Um, and this is, this is the, uh, these are the estimates of, of um, carbon emissions across, across Massachusetts by, by track. And there are two reasons why cities end up looking a lot greener. This is from research of mine with Matthew Kahn, uh, one of which is less driving in, in high density areas, of course, which is not surprising. Uh, and it's not just an issue of taking public transportation, right? It's also an issue of just the distances involved are just much lower when you're at higher densities. And, and secondly, of course, it's because of the less living space, even holding income and family size constant, not holding those factors constant. The average single family detached house in the US uses 88% more electricity than the average urban apartment, right? A huge, a huge gap. Now, the reason why these things matter are really important is the great growing cities of China and in India. And these are our, our estimates of CO2 emissions by metropolitan area in China. Um, and while China is already the world's largest carbon emitter, the household sector of China is actually still pretty green. Um, while they do, in fact, involve some carbon from home heating, particularly in the north, um, they don't air condition and they don't drive very much still, even though they're selling some very large number of cars every, every year. Now, if China increases to U.S. levels of carbon emissions, the levels of in sprawling America, and if India does the same, global carbon emissions will increase by 127%. If instead these countries level off the level seen in an also wealthy place, Hong Kong, all right, global emissions increase by less than 25%. So density is you know, not just about productivity and not just about pleasure. It's also, in fact, exactly the opposite of what Thoreau has told us to do. It's also pretty, pretty darn green. Um, and I think this is a good place to stop, but I want to stop on a more optimistic note because I mean, fundamentally this book is a very optimistic book which is we still face enormous challenges, right? And we're reeling from the disasters of Japan today, and, and certainly the challenges of the Middle East continue to be with us, and the challenges of global warming continue to be, to be with us. And yet, I think the history of, a, of humankind's urban past gives us plenty of reason to hope that our species, when connected by cities, when we work together and learn from each other in these great masses of creativity and collaboration, is capable of doing really miraculous things and coming up with incredible new ideas which have the ability to, to solve problems as John Snow solved problems in the 1850s. And I think for that reason, uh, not that I'm particularly sure I have the answers to any of these problems, but because I just have faith in the collective ability to, to create things in cities, uh, I think the triumph of the city ultimately is about the triumph of our species as well. And in fact, it's a good thing that we recently moved from being less than 50% urban to being more than 50% urban. And that's actually a reason for hope. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I will now sit down. success story, does that really inherently rely on the com competitive element that only one country can sort of dominate and that the rest are therefore losing out? So, so uh, you know, the, the good people of Chicago and Los Angeles uh, <laughs> would actually take issue with the view that, that New York, you know, bestrides America like an urban colossus. Um, and and uh, I think it is certainly, there are certainly lots of, lots of countries where it is possible to have many, many areas. And, it's not as if, uh, if you just think back to sort of the productivity connection with metropolitan size, it's not as if there's a, uh, you know, explosion at the upper tail or that there's a tailing off, there's sort of a monotonic positive connection between urban scale and growth. Now, about 
almost 20 years ago, I wrote a paper called uh, Trade and Surfaces Explaining Urban Science that actually tried to understand what, what factors explained what share of a country's urban population was, was in the largest city. Um, and there's certain things which aren't surprising. So larger countries, the bigger the scale of the country, unsurprisingly, is, is tends to be able to sustain more large cities. Certainly there are you know, a lot of very large cities in, in India, many of which are capable of having lots of entrepreneurship and lots of competition. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't look and say Delhi or Mumbai or Bangalore or uh, the, other, the other cities are you know, unique in their <coughs> control of India. Indeed, it would be shocking in a country of 1.1 billion people that you had one urban, urban mega city that dominates the whole uh, the whole area. Indeed, I think we should expect the same thing in, in China uh, as well. The smaller the country, the more likely it is to be, you know, to be one primate, primate city. But there are other factors which also explain it. And in fact, some of the most important ones are politics. In most of the world, the largest city is a is a capital city. And in our sample, it was something like 79 out of 85 of the primate of the largest cities were capital were capital cities as well. Indeed, almost all the cases that aren't are former former British colonies. Uh, which um, indeed for, you know, in, in part because they, they, they had constitutions that were designed to prevent the primate cities from, their capital cities from coming too, becoming too large, put their capitals in all sorts of godforsaken places, uh, like swamps near the Potomac, uh, conveniently located near George Washington's property. Uh, the, uh, the, the, and I think that, that sort of hints at the political importance of this. So if you look at stable democracies, they have much smaller primate cities than unstable, unstable regimes or dictatorships. And I think the reason for this is that is that stable democracies tend to have a lot of things in place that ensure that all the money doesn't go to the people who are close to power. Okay? But in fact, in a dictatorship or in an unstable regime where you don't have strong constitutional protections for empty land in Montana, say, uh, you, have, you have a strong tendency of, of largesse to flow to the people who are close nearby. Um, and in fact, this is the, the usual pattern in the unstable regimes in the world is that the, you know, the dictators fear local mobs, but they don't fear people in distant, in distant areas. And as a result, they channel the resources to those, to those, those areas. So, uh, I mean, I think that, that creates in some sense cities that are artificially too large because of these political pressures to favor the close mm -hmm. in various, in various areas. Good Where to begin? There's lots and lots of reasons. I think we should take a couple together, maybe, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I think we should go to Bridget, as a gentleman next to her, and then Alex. Hi, uh, I'd like to explore the small firm, large firm issue, because this, I absolutely agree that the connections, the small firms, this is the way we get the innovation and the success and, and bring stuff together. But there's almost a kind of, isn't there an inevitable consequence that we then get large firms, because these are the ones who are then going to exploit the economies of scale. And economies of scale then what leads to everybody being able to have a crop, for example, until the next wave comes along. So is this just a kind of a way that we just have to manage those waves of innovation, invention, scale, and until the next one comes along? And is there a better way of doing it? Uh, thanks, I'm Dermot Finch, I'm at Fishburne Hedges, um, at Fantastic. Uh, can you say a few words about the right-sizing cities agenda in the US? So, Places like Flint, Michigan, etc. And is it is that just kind of talk, or it, will it lead to you know a significantly different direction for um, struggling small, smaller urban areas like that? Well, those, those two are quite related. It's a good, good idea maybe to get those two just together. Josh, I'm pretty, I, 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 I missed the key connection between you, but I really <laughs> 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 They are, they are both Detroit questions in, in a sense. So uh, right sizing is so the, the um, there are a couple of different elements in, in right sizing. They are they are related to the sort of Detroit industrial monolith and the and the moving the moving out stuff. So so right sizing has a, a sort of core philosophical element, which I think is important, which is just recognizing that the city of two million people in Detroit is never going to come back again, and you shouldn't be worried about that. You should be worried about providing the brightest future for the people living in the city, regardless of how many people it should be chasing some will of the wisp miracle number of expanding, uh, of expanding the population. Um, the, the straight physical side of it, which tends to be about eliminating empty buildings and replacing them with something else, um, I, I think is fundamentally good policy. Okay, if it's um, you know, there are there are uh, adverse stories that I haven't seen all that well documented. 
but about, say, extensive use of eminent domain to do this, that we're actually kicking out people who are actually living in their house. And I think that's a, that's, I mean, the case, the case where if you've actually just got block after block of empty homes, the case for knocking them down and finding out some other, you know, relatively inexpensive, better use of that space, that seems like a, a, like a no-brainer. Once you've got people living in the area, it's no longer a no-brainer, and that's, that's, a, that's a harder thing to, to follow. But while right-sizing and figuring out better space, better use of the space in Detroit is, is, a, is a useful thing, it's not fundamentally the thing that will bring the city back, or it's not fundamentally the thing that will make a difference in the lives of the children in Detroit, which in some sense is the most important thing. Um, and that's, that's fundamentally got to be about improving the education and the human capital investment in those kids with early childhood interventions and by allowing more competition in, in America's schools. Um, the, I mean, and I, I, you know, I guess I may come back to charters later, but the, the, it's, um, the evidence on the successful charter schools in the U.S. is very, very strong. And in part, it's very, very strong because the school systems that they're replacing are so often so troubled that just having anything that's sort of an agent of change is a, is a good thing. Um, and it's also, they're also, you know, many of the charter experts believe strongly they're just successful because they involve longer hours that, you know, particularly in, in difficult social situations, just having more hours in a safe school with sensible adults who are doing sensible things is just a big, big improvement on over the other things that they could be doing. And I think that's fundamentally, you know, I mean, I'm fine with the right side. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it, it can't, you know, it can't blind us to the most important thing, which is investing in human capital of the children of Detroit. On the issue of uh, firms becoming larger and moving out, um, certainly this this is what happens, right? I mean, successful small firms become big firms, and that's a that's a perfectly reasonable thing to happen. They often then leave these leave the city, right? And that's that's I think part of the issue. That's the sort of worrisome thing is that you have, you know, in the case of Detroit, you have a city that becomes dominated by a few large firms, not having a, a continuing process where small firms become large firms and some of them some of them get out. Now the problem is, and that's that's I think ultimately what you what you want is you want the the in New York to attract uh, John E. Rockefeller when he's starting off in Standard Oil, and then. Years later, you know, the Standard Oil Company in New York, Mobile, uh, Mobile Oil, and my, my mom worked there when I was a kid in the in the 70s. You know, it, it moves out to Fairfax, Virginia, and that's uh, you know, it ceased to get the benefits of New York, and that's healthy. But there are lots of other small firms in New York that are going on. So I think that's the that's the sort of thing that you hope for in an entrepreneurial city. It's a constant stream of new innovation in a in a uh, in an entrepreneurial place. Now, in terms of management, management is very tough with entrepreneurship. It's not as if you know the the things that we know the government has done historically that have been helpful in many areas of entrepreneurship are often in Silicon Valley, and many of the tech clusters are intimately tied together with universities. Uh, the story of Silicon Valley that I tell in the, tell in the thing is intimately related to Stanford, not, not a public entity, uh, but a private entity, but a, and a private entity that's very focused on practical knowledge. And then it starts off with Federal Telegraph in 1908, which is a, a I think it's tied to, tied to Stanford decades before the Fair Children and Shockley and any of, any of the other stories, but it's, it's a much older story to get into time. Uh, entrepreneurship can also be embedded by you know, trying to eliminate the unnecessary regulations and hold back. But uh, governments are not great at managing this process, and it's not clear how they could possibly be so. I mean, it's a, the job of the venture capitalist is hard for people who are incredibly skilled at it, and it's not you know it's it's not at all obvious how the government's going to manage this thing in a, in a sensible way. So uh, I wish that I knew a better way of managing it, but um, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I do. But I do know that it probably makes sense to, to that those, I mean, the one thing I would say is that those, these are mostly initial city governments in the US, but those cities that think that they're gonna come back by attracting some large big box firm that's gonna locate there for a while, that's unlikely to be all that productive in the long run. people here as well, you have to In terms of the environment, um, sorry, actually I'm not going to policy exchange. Um, in terms of the environment, uh, whether or not they stop at uh, countries like China, India, Africa, as it quickly follows behind, whether they stop at Western European levels or American levels of CO2 emissions, surely we're, we're kind of in trouble either way, and the answer that has to be more technology, so electric cars, that might be the solution. That would be the first thing. And the second thing uh, I would just say is, um, are the suburbs not part of the city? So in America, we have this city versus suburbs argument. In Britain, we've sort of tried to destroy that, so we've created huge green belts around all of our cities. All that's happening is people have jumped over the green belts and gone to rural areas. So instead of having suburban sprawl, we just have an increasing population in rural areas. Sure. So, so let me not let me let me agree with your point that um, you know, uh, technology is surely going to be part of whatever solution is going to happen to global warming. And indeed, that's one of when we think about the solutions that cities or, or dense agglomerations of various forms are going to provide. Certainly, technology is, is developing to be rich, and I'm sure that you're I'm sure that you're right on, on that. Um, the um, 
but it's going to be easier for technology if guys are living in smaller apartments and driving shorter distances, right? So it's it's uh, the the um, the other point, which is about suburbs, right? Is, is that um, the, the you know so I, I live in a suburb as I, as I uh, talked about in the book as I talked about earlier, and certainly if for for me and for you know, millions of other people, suburbs are a way of having a half urban existence, right? So I you know I I work in a city and have all the benefits of the rich uh, you know intellectual uh, connections there. I could take my kids to, to downtown Boston as I try to do at least one day on every weekend to to actually enjoy the, the culture that's that's there, and you know I can. Play my, you know, I can have the extra space that suburbs make possible, and also have take advantage or not have like put put of uh, good suburban school districts. Um, uh, so it's a sort of half urban existence, and it's one that obviously appeals to lots of people. Uh, I don't, you know, obviously it wouldn't be my place to criticize suburban living, as I've obviously chosen it. Well, my family has chosen it. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 although I, I will confess that I, I am indeed counting the days until my, my youngest child graduates from high school, which is unfortunately 15 years from now. But, but I, I have every intention of moving into a studio apartment in the city as soon as that happens. Uh, but um, that, you know, the point of the book in terms of the U.S. context, and this is more, much more relevant to the U.S. than here, is the U.S. has this trifecta of anti-European policies our, our subsidization of home ownership, our highway subsidies, and the, the you know, school system that's tr strongly biased against urban areas, all of which are you know, ripe for reform, all of which are enormously costly. So it's not, you know, I'm, I'm a economist, right? I'm not a lifestyle consultant. I'm perfectly happy with people choosing whatever type of life they want, but they shouldn't have the, the choice strongly pushed for them for, uh, for the government. So this week in my Times Economics blog, I was calling on the Tea Party to rise up and, and fight against suburban subsidies. Which I don't think we actually <laughs> but but nonetheless, I felt constrained to argue that they should live, live up to the uh, free to choose uh, or live free or die uh, mantra. But certainly, uh, certainly, you're right. Cities are suburbs are a way of taking advantage of, of both central city and non city, uh, not uh, and, and non urban advantage of some things. I'm sure we look forward to pairing you up with Sarah Palin the next time you're back. Um, <laughs> Uh, you talked about the right, sorry, Tim Loyning from London School of Economics and Centre Forum. You talked about the rising return to new ideas, which I think is spot on. And that might imply larger cities or a greater value of being really, really close to people. But it's really slow to get around cities. It's no faster to get around London today than it was in 1900. It's pretty slow to get around Boston. So I wonder what ideas you have as to what we can do to actually make cities fast to move around. Well, you can improve your congestion pricing system. You know that's that's it's it's a start, but it's a it's a it's a modest start. And of course, there's you know the, the other great form of public transportation, the really fast one that tends not to subject for a lot of a lot of uh, congestion, is the elevator. A great tool for getting people around <laughs> together when combined with very tall buildings, right? That's a that's a uh, that's a terrific means of, of transportation. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have anything particularly more revolutionary. Uh, more revolutionary <laughs> than that, but, Peter Franklin, I work over at uh, Parliament. Um, you spoke about the, the key um, uh, planning policy should be um, removing restrictions on building in, in city centres. Um, how would you balance that against livability? Because uh, livability is another reason why people move out of cities and to the countryside. So I think in some senses density actually promotes livability, right? It's not it's not that density is always a foe of building, right? Building building taller buildings, you know, can often mean building building buildings that are more you know separated from the noise of the of the city streets. They can also often mean city building buildings that actually provide more space for, for families. And indeed, you know, I mean the 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 comparative advantage of Chicago, to a certain extent, is providing a uh, more affordable urban experience for, for Americans than New York. And that's made possible by the cranes that Mayor Daly has unleashed on Lake Michigan. Uh, that density also, of course, enables the, you know, the an even richer restaurant scene, an even, even richer uh, uh, set, of, set of amenities that provide food density, all of which is, uh, is possible. Um, so I don't see a fundamental trade-off there, as long as, of course, you have a well-functioning government that manages the downsides of density. But I think that we are, you know, I think you know, London in 2011 is at that place. I don't think we have a, have a, you know, this is not, 
In the case of Kinshasa, we can talk about whether or not this is a, uh, but you know, London is, is uh, as is New York. I think that the larger issues in terms of London, I think, have more to do with the historic beauty of the city and has more to do with the, the great value that green space has to do with this. And those are, those are real genuine trade-offs, and I don't mean to suggest that they're not there. And indeed, the, the Bloomberg solution, which was allowing a lot of mass tying in older industrial areas that had lost their value, it's a lot to be said for that. The one thing that you do want to do, though, in these areas is make sure that you use them to their fullest, right? I mean, if you're, that the, 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 way, the best way to balance preservation and providing space is when you have got an area that you're allowed to be building, bring that area up, for goodness sakes, you know, Put, put as much put much stuff on that area as you can. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not talking about public subsidies here. I'm just talking about not creating barriers to private entrepreneurs doing what they would want to do with, with building. Time for a couple more questions. There's a good deal of and then gentleman in the white shirt. Thanks. I'm glad I some policy exchange. I wanted to ask about quality of life issues and what people are prepared to put up with living in, mm -hmm. in cities. And one of those is clearly crime. And you touched on um, the story of, of, of New York. What do we know about how that crime epidemic in the 70s and 80s was um, sort of contributing to the decline of that city and with the flight, and, and how much of it was a product of, of a decline that was happening already? So the, the impacts of uh, the Barry Cullen and Levitt estimates that are in the paper on crime and the urban exodus suggest a non-trivial effect, but not uh, you know an, a not a vast effect. So crime certainly has a negative, a negative impact. It would be a mistake to, you know, blame the, the decline in these older, colder cities on, on crime above, above all. It was certainly, and in many cases, it was more likely to follow the decline than actually precede it. Um, and the estimates that have been done of, you know, let's say how much, how much the decline crime contributed to New York's rise in property values, it's something, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not everything. Um, and. For the U.S., the big challenge is that we've managed to make our cities much safer, but we've done so by incarcerating a vast number of young people for relatively minor offenses. And that's not without a very significant human cost. That's not without destroying a fair amount of fairly valuable human capital. And I think the challenge for American cities going forward is to try to figure out how to remain in places of relative safety uh, and keep that, while at the same time locking up fewer people. And, and that's, a, that's a challenge that, that American cities still face. Um, to, to question. I'm a tenant from Plan Projects, we're a regeneration consultancy. Um, there's a common policy within regen urban regeneration uh, to break down the homogeneity of communities, communities that have uh, really become senior states or where there's a you know, concentration of, of, of poor people, unskilled people. And a way of, uh, of addressing that is to try and bring, try to encourage um, skilled people, people in higher incomes, to enter those neighborhoods through, through um, residential projects and other projects. I was just intrigued by your concept of skilled neighbors and what that means, what, what are the implications of that in terms of, in terms of urban regeneration, in terms of turning around those parts of our cities that are, that are, that are, you know, that are um, suffer from inner city problems. You know, the, 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 certainly the, the whole advantage of urban connection can be longs to their communities that become walled off in the cities around them. And that's, that's certainly one of the great tragedies of say segregation in American cities that you see tremendously lower outcomes for African Americans who grow up in more segregated metropolitan areas relative to less segregated metropolitan areas. The thorny issue is what in the world to do about it. And um, if there are some things that can be done by just eliminating those policies that actually contributed to it, so the public housing projects that masked poor people on narrow narrow areas of uh, land, those are very difficult things to do. And, and certainly the you know the moving towards that say voucher system that at least offers some more promise of, of connection. Um, but the evidence on randomized vouchers don't show huge, I mean, they show, so the moving to opportunity experiment randomly gave people vouchers, and those bad vouchers enabled people to leave high poverty areas in, in the US. But the outcomes for the kids were very mixed. It turned out that girls did better and boys did worse uh, in, the, in the groups that were randomly allocated vouchers versus non vouchers. I, I still think, you know, vouchers are good housing policy. And I still think it's a heck of a lot better than building the failed massive housing projects of, of America's American cities. And you know, people still people want them, and it's a, you know something that actually clearly does something good. But they don't seem to be in any sense of, of a panacea. Maybe it's because the kids were too old when they moved out. I don't I don't know. Um, but um, I mean, I think that the the spirit of your question of your comment is surely right. That actually something that creates more mixing, it creates less isolation, is, is urgent to be desired. Urgent. 
language. It's hard to figure out how to do that. Uh, and I think that's the, certainly the history of attempting to socially engineer less segregation in the US is very, very fraught with conflict and, and with peril. And I don't think um, it's something that we should in any sense give up on, uh, but it's just hard. And it's hard to do it from the top down in a way that makes sense. So uh, I, I wish you luck in anything that you're able to, to do about this. And I hope that you generate more lessons that are more hopeful than the comment that I just, I just gave on it. But I think it's certainly a very important problem to be, to be thought of in the years ahead. So I think we've got time for two last questions. There's a, a gentleman right next to you and then a gentleman in the front. Uh, Richard Lark, Computer Science. I was interested in the, uh, the picture of Arkwright, and I think you did show Cromford. Um, yes. At least, at least when I put it off of wiki images, it said it's Cromford. <laughs> they, they, uh, the... um, D. H. Lawrence said uh, that the English didn't know how to live in the city, the city by reference by comparison to the Italian. And it's interesting that a lot of that industrial revolution was a rural focus. Um, and I was fascinated by your comment about the idea of you know, Ford taking the industry out of Detroit and being somewhere else. So, um, you know, I think there's an English exceptionalism here, but what's our future in terms of being able to make real urbanism work when actually there's quite there's an argument for saying that British people actually really prefer being in the country anyway. And things better when they're there. If, if British people are so um, just you know, single time, single you know, focused on love in the countries from wine to London, real estate's so expensive, right? I mean, the, the, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not as if, I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of the, of the, of the view of how the, the love of the countryside is, is baked into the guide in the wool of, of the Englishman. And, and yet, um, it's it's the it's hard to think of a more successful and desired city today than, than this this one that we're sitting in here right now. I hear similar things about Americans as well, right? That uh, you know we have this called the Thomas Jefferson's curse, this tendency to think that city, our cities are decaying and corrupt, and that the American dream can only lie behind a white picket fence in the summers. And that's that's indeed one of the reasons why I wrote the book because I think that that's utter nonsense. The cities are not decaying or corrupt, and that the American dream can be found in lots of different places, and people should be free to choose. Um, but I'm not, again, and this comes back to an earlier question, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, particularly convince anyone who actually wants to be on greenery to pick up roots and move to the city. I'm just trying to make sure that they have options and, and are not being pushed by the, the state into one type of uh, one type of living, regardless of where they want to be, want to, to live. And I think that inevitably leads me to be, I guess, a bit of a cheerleader for sensible additions to privately supplied density in London that make that would enable more families that actually want to live here and be able to do it. And in the US it leads me to oppose those policies that turn Thomas Jefferson's disregard into cities into a, a dogma of federal federal policy. Um, Michael Cowell from the National Audit Office. Um, can I ask a stupid Star Trek question? It would be a wonderful way to end. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let me ask the question in a stupid way first, and then in a slightly less stupid way. The stupid way is, well, if we all had you know, Star Trek teleporters, then we wouldn't have cities. And the slightly stupid less way of asking the question is, as I understand it, you say cities have thrived despite technological improvements in the last Because of that. Because of that. Oh, okay. Well, the argument that you know, because of email and video conferencing, and that we, you know, despite that, we still need to talk to each other. Be the same. Thing. Isn't that just that the technology isn't good enough yet, and in another twenty years we'll be able to have three D holograms where we will be able to, you know, have enough resolution to be able to do the same thing that we can do by being in the same room? So that's that's, that's not a stupid question at all. It's, it's a very it's a very smart question. And yet, um, the, the, the full lead me up Scotty technology, uh, that, that one may indeed challenge the need to look right here. I don't think it's right on the horizon. And let, let me counter with that other example of, of uh, you know, of technological features, the Jetsons, another, another, another <laughs> where they were certainly, because of advancements in, in building up, Living on top of each other in cities, going around in their little in their little space cars with Astro the dog. Uh, the the so uh, I mean, you know, when that technology occurs, we'll talk uh, on, on, on the on the issue of of teleconferencing. I think even if you're able to make planned meetings more effective, 
and, and that could potentially reduce the number of business meetings. You still don't have the unplanned stuff that's so crucial, right? I mean, the important thing is not the fact that, you know, Joe and Sam plan a meeting and as a result, you know, you can do that electronically. You don't have to actually meet face to face. You can actually, you know, have a, have a hot run. And I think that may well happen, but we still are, you know, as we know, we still are a long way from doing that. But what about Joe's assistant? who's, you know, learning so much by being around Joe every day and learning the things that, you know, Joe never planned to teach him, right? I mean, that's the stuff that guys are getting in, in the city here. That's the stuff that guys, that guys are getting in, in New York. And that's the stuff that's a lot harder to figure out any planned technology uh, fix. I, I just think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that new technology, electronic technologies, and face-to-face and -face contact are, are complements rather than substitutes put together rather than replace each other. Certainly, the faxes, faxes and email were supposed to eliminate business travel, but that's gone up enormously over the past 25 years, in part because we moved to a more connected, more globalized world, and that's been made possible by these electronic technologies. Certainly, if you look at who calls each other, who uses these technologies to connect with each other, it's people who live close to each other, right? And this is from the old telephone data that, that Bell put together. It's not people who never meet each other, it's people who actually, actually connect. And I think this is eventually what Facebook is going to do as well. It's a way of organizing, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. It's not a way of, 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 of connecting people who are never going to actually meet with each other. Uh, in some sense, in terms of the consumption side of the I have a line in the book, which is, you know, I just, I just can't imagine a world in which connecting in cyberspace will ever, ever you know, be equal of sharing a, a meal or a smile or a kiss, right? I mean, they, these things are baked into us as, as species and likely and likely to continue. And I think the the long run is more of a change in telephones were associated with more, not less urbanization over time. People declared that the telephone was also going to be a great equalizer for rural areas. It wasn't. Uh, and if you go back to even older changes, like the book, right? How's that for a form of long distance learning technology, right? You, know, you, could, have, you know, could have easily thought that that would have just enabled everyone to live on their farms. And certainly the opposite is true, right? The book ushered in a more urban, urban world and a more, and a more connected world. So, uh, you know, I think, I think these technologies are at least as likely to be beneficial to cities and to when they make face-to-face -face contact more, uh, more powerful and more important than ever. I mean, it just takes a lot of technology to undo millions of years of evolution a brilliantly futuristic note for us to end on. Yeah. Um, I think this has been one of the best events we've had in a, in a very, very long time. I love, I love this, the sweep of your book as someone running a think tank. It's usually flattering to think that the, the motivating force in human history it turns out to be exchange of ideas, yeah. the kind of business that we're, we're in. But um, in a, in a wonderful presentation, do, do grab the book from the back. Uh, and I, I can only really say thank you so much. One of the best presentations I've heard in years. Fantastic. Thank you.